Hi everyone, let's start talking about section 9.2, where we're going to go a little bit farther into gas laws. Let me introduce Monsieur Jacques Charles, extreme sportsman of yesteryear. Um, this guy was uh, one of the early balloonists, which uh, is a pretty extreme sport if you think about it back in the day. I mean, he's flying around in a basket there. We don't have compressed gas yet, so they're literally like stoking a fire in order to get the hot gas inside that balloon. Um, this really was a pretty extreme idea at the time, so I'm pretty impressed with Monsieur Jacques Charles. Um, Charles's law is similar to Boyle's law in that it looks at the relationship between two quantities. In Boyle's law, we looked at the relationship between pressure and volume, and that's an inversely proportional relationship. As pressure increases, volume decreases. But Charles's law refers to the relationship between temperature and volume. And the hotter a gas gets, the more space it takes up. And that might seem intuitive. So the formula that I'm going to introduce looks a little bit different. Instead of P1V1 equals P2V2, it's T1V2 equals T2V1. And we can rearrange the equation as well to show that it's the ratio of volume and temperature which is constant, unlike in Boyle's law where it's the product of pressure and volume which is constant. Now this is assuming that the mole amount and the pressure are not going to change, and if the mole amount and the pressure are going to be held constant, then temperature and volume have a directly proportional relationship. Now I need to go back to exactly how crazy it was for Jacques Charles to do this ballooning trick. His original balloon was pretty different from modern long-distance balloons, where we not only have access to different gases like helium, um, but we have all sorts of different materials we can use. Charles's original balloon was essentially a canvas balloon, and flying over the French countryside in the late 1700s was a pretty impressive feat. Now, it is true that at one point in time, his unmanned balloon landed into a field where terrified French peasants destroyed it with pitchforks and knives. And I can't help when I look at this lithograph of the terrified French peasants, can't help but imagining this face being on one of them. There's Gaston leading the charge to pitchfork the strange UFO that's landed in their field. Of course, it didn't stop Jacques Charles from pioneering this technology further, and he piloted a manned flight three months later. So in order to fly a hot air balloon, you need to understand gas laws. Here is a sample problem of how we can apply Charles's law, which relates temperature and volume. See if you can give it a try. So in this problem, we're taking 1.3 liters of gas and the temperature is dropping from 25 down to negative 78 Celsius. So the drop in temperature should correspond to a decrease in volume. Let's see if the calculation bears that out. So I've got the initial volume and I've got the initial temperature. The initial temperature, remember, is 25 degrees Celsius. You also hopefully remember that all temperatures must be in Kelvin in this entire unit. So that means the temperature here needs to be converted to Kelvins. That's 25 plus 273. That's 295 Kelvin. We are going to use the rules for significant figures for addition, which states that the number with the least precise placeholder value is going to dictate how many um, placeholder value units we can include. So this is going to be 295 Kelvin. We want to solve for the final volume when the temperature drops down to negative 78. So what's negative 78 in Kelvin? Again, we need to go ahead and take 273 and add it to our number. So negative 78 plus 273, that gives me a temperature in Kelvin of 195. 195 Kelvins. Now technically we refer to Kelvin temperature as Kelvins, and it's not degrees Kelvin, it's just Kelvins. So how are we going to take this equation, which you might remember is T1V2 equals T2V1, and rearrange it to solve for V2. Pretty straightforward bit of algebra, right? V2 is going to be T2V1 divided by T1. Let's go ahead and plug those numbers in and see what we get. T2V1 is 195 multiplied by... Our initial volume, 
I'm going to divide that by the final, excuse me, unit. we're going to divide that by the initial temperature, which is 295. And we get 0.859. Now that is a lower volume than original. So that makes sense. If the temperature drops, the volume drops. And not only that, the temperature has dropped by about one third of the total temperature in Kelvins. And the volume has been decreased by about one third. So that makes sense. Rounding that to the correct number of significant figures, which in this case is 3, gives me 0 0.859 liters. And now it says we're going to pause from this commercial message from STP. Now STP is a product that I don't think you see advertised or sold anymore, but I guess this is just sort of a dated joke. In chemistry, STP stands for standard temperature and pressure, not whatever this, you know, motor oil product was. And occasionally in problems, it's going to simply say that the final pressure is standard pressure. The initial temperature is standard temperature or STP conditions. And STP conditions stands for standard temperature and pressure conditions. That is one atmosphere and 273 Kelvin. So you might think that standard temperature would be um, room temperature and STP for gases refers to actually the freezing point of water, zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. So be on the lookout for this statement and problems that says at STP, it means one atmosphere of pressure and 273 Kelvin. And of course, if the pressure units are in PSI, that's 14.7 PSI. If they're in millimeters of mercury, that's 760 millimeters of mercury. And if they're in kilopascal, that's 101.3 kilopascal. All of those pressures are equal to one standard atmosphere. Let's try one more practice problem. In this practice problem, it asks what temperature would cause 50 mils of air at STP to expand to a final volume of 60 mils? Well, let's see. If we're call, talking about an increase in volume, then that would be caused by an increase in temperature. That's not a big increase in volume, but that allows us to make a prediction as to what increase in temperature might correspond to that. We're going to assume constant pressure and, of course, a constant number of moles. So see if you can set up this problem, pause the video, do the calculation, and see if you agree with the answer that I'm about to show. All right. What temperature would cause 50 mils of air at STP to expand to a final volume of 60? So it's asking for a final temperature. What final temperature would cause a gas to expand from 50 mils, my initial volume, to 60 mils, my final volume? The initial temperature is important to know. It says at STP. And remember, STP means 273 Kelvin. So if we want to rearrange the equation T1V2 equals T2V1 and solve for T2, then we're going to use T1V2 divided by V1. Let's go ahead and plug those numbers in. Now my calculator says 327.6. I'm going to round that to three significant figures and that gives me 330. Now that makes sense for a Kelvin temperature because my volume only went up by about one-sixth of its original amount and that would correspond to a temperature rise of about one-sixth of the original amount. You can see why using Kelvin temperature is important. If you do this calculation in Celsius, then you'll get an incorrect answer. That final answer should be rounded to three significant figures, 328 kelvins, and not two significant figures, 330. Let's talk about one more important point in this video, which is the relationship between temperature and volume and how it relates to the Kelvin temperature scale. Charles's law is related to the concept of absolute zero in this way. Imagine taking a sealed container of gas with a movable piston. If you subject that container of gas at constant pressure to a ever lower temperature, then the volume will decrease. So that first point on the graph 
which corresponds to the upper picture there. You'll see there's one, two, three, four, five, six particles drawn. Let's that say that that corresponds to six moles of gas. And there's just one weight on top of that movable piston. Let's say that corresponds to one atmosphere of pressure. As the temperature drops, you can see there's the same number of moles of gas and the same pressure, but the volume has decreased. Now, if we continue to drop the temperature, we'll see that the volume continues to decrease in a linear fashion. And maybe we'll get to a point where we don't have a cold enough freezer. There is no freezer we have cold enough to drop the temperature anymore. But we can imagine that that linear relationship is going to extrapolate out. And you'll see that it hits the intercept of the x-axis at 273 below zero. Now, we have some pretty cold freezers. And you may remember in a video we watched earlier this year about absolute zero, we've been able to get gases like helium very, very close to absolute zero. As the temperature gets colder and colder, the volume gets smaller and smaller. So why is the volume decreasing? Remember that temperature is simply a measure of kinetic energy. So at a lower temperature, those particles have less kinetic energy, which means the collisions that they're going to have with the surface of the container are going to be less frequent and less forceful, because less kinetic energy means a lower average velocity. So as temperature drops, it makes sense that pressure would drop as well, since pressure is the result of molecular collisions, which happen less frequently and less forcefully at lower and lower temperatures. It's important to remember that absolute zero is not a temperature that's been reached. Theoretically, at absolute zero, all molecular motion stops since there's no pressure. And really what happens as we approach absolute zero is repulsive forces between molecules and particles start to overcome. And that's what prevents us from reaching absolute zero. In the next video, we'll talk about a couple of other gas relationships, including that between number of moles and volume called Avogadro's Law, and another one that looks at the relationship between temperature and pressure. And a lot of these gas laws are going to start to seem very similar. They're either inversely proportional relationships or they're directly proportional relationships or linear relationships, inverse or um, linear. So those last two concepts will go a little bit more quickly. We'll see you next time.